program was recorded at RELA's annual logistics conference in Orlando, Florida. I'm pleased to welcome Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain, Russell Goodman. Pacific Northwest Transloading. Here to speak with us today about that is Greg Borose, Senior Manager, Trade and Carrier Development at the Port of Portland. Greg, welcome. Thank you, Russell. Greg, explain for the viewers, if you will, uh, about the economics of Pacific Northwest transloading. Sure. Uh, transloading through the Pacific Northwest ports in the U.S. can be very viable for numbers of shippers because uh, we have excess 53-foot equipment in the Pacific Northwest ports. In addition, we have warehouses with available space in close proximity to the rail facilities. So it makes for a seamless transportation opportunity for those shippers who do transload their cargo. How would you say from a cost standpoint that uh, transloading compares with intact intermodal routing? Well, it really does depend upon the routing for that individual shipper, but in terms of the disparity in pricing for a backhaul of 53-foot equipment, and given that the drayage distance from terminal to rail in the PNW ports is so short, there can be some real economic benefits for many shippers. Would you say that any particular commodities are best suited for PNW transloading? Sure, that, that's a great question. Uh, actually, palletized cargo, uh, where the seal can be broken in a secure environment, is obviously one of the main criteria. Uh, certain non-hazardous and food commodity groups probably are not suitable for transloading. But if it's palletized, white goods, uh, we do tires uh, quite frequently in the PNW, and many, many of the electronic goods in a secure environment are quite viable for transloading. Let's talk for just a moment about the proximity of warehouse space to marine terminals. Now, how do you feel that that uh, impacts the cost of transloading? Well, certainly anything that can be done to minimize those drays and the cost of moving the cargo from the ocean facility into the transload location to where it gets delivered back to the rail yard is beneficial. And the PNW ports have the advantage of ample, low-cost warehouse space in close proximity to those rail ramps. For just a moment, let's explore port pairs. You know, what origins and destinations are probably best suited for uh, the PNW transloading that we're talking about. Sure, uh, certainly the northern China region uh, offers a great opportunity as well as Japan and Korea. Any of the port pairs that are not otherwise fully serviced by some of the other networks going to other regional areas. It may not make sense for cargo coming out of Singapore or India, but certainly for that northern China and that northern uh, Japan and Korea region, it does make a lot of sense. Now, here's an opportunity for, uh, I would imagine, a proponent of PNW transloading, you know, to, uh, to give us uh, some positive information about your area. How do you feel that it compares to Western Canada or Pacific Southwest or U.S. East Coast operations? Well, of course, each, each shipper needs to look at their routing and their economics, uh, the location of their distribution centers. That's the major factor. But again, for those, uh, for those shippers that allow their cargo to be transloaded at the port, they have an advantage because uh, there will be lower costs through the PNW ports than other West Coast ports. Certainly the steaming time and the bunker use and the charges that the ocean carriers will assess for cargo going into the West Coast versus the Panama Canal will provide a benefit. The Canadian Gateway isn't really suited for transloading uh, because it's primarily an intact intermodal service. It doesn't directly compete with PNW transloading. So again, for each shipper, uh, for each case, uh, it can make a lot of sense uh, depending upon their economics. And those are economics that uh, the PNW ports are, are willing to look into with those individual shippers. Service providers for PNW transloading, who are they? Well, the rail service providers, of course, are the uh, Class 1 railroads, the Burlington Northern, uh, Santa Fe, and the Union Pacific. And those facilities are uh, fully offered uh, from those railroads through all the PNW ports. In addition, uh, you've got the major 3PL service providers, uh, expediters, uh, a number of other 3PLs that work in the area. And the backhaul 53-foot equipment is provided by J.B. Hunt, Schneider, 
uh, Pacer and many of those large domestic truck, op truck operators. So we really do have uh, the nexus of all those different groups coming together along with ample warehouse space to make it viable. Greg, final question, uh, and it's a prospective one. As we, uh, as we look forward in 2010, how confident are you at the Port of Portland? And uh, quite frankly, how confident are other uh, Pacific ports about cargo volumes? Are they going up? Where are they likely to be going throughout the, uh, the balance of the year? Well, certainly we see a slight uptick from uh, the, the depths of uh, the economic downturn in 2008-2009, and that's starting to show in our container numbers already in 2010. This is a similar trend that the other PNW ports are experiencing. That being said, it's going to be a difficult year uh, with the ocean carriers constraining volume, slow speeding their ships, uh, as well as the issue of constrained capacity throughout the Trans-Pacific. So given that, I would say it will be well into 2010, uh, late, latter part or early 2011, before we in the PNW see a full ramp up of capacity. The PNW ports very much respond to the volumes that are already in play in the PSW, the Southern California ports in particular, and we tend to see our volumes move up as those volumes in the south get more robust. Uh, there will be more opportunities for vessel deployments as the overall transportation network for ocean carriers recovers in uh, 2011 and beyond. We see the largest ships being deployed in those major markets in, um, in Europe to Asia. That's a major market for the carriers. Also into the PSW and eventually when the Panama Canal opens, there will be the large ships deployed through the Panama by 2014. The PNW will definitely see the five, six, and 7,000 TEU size ship continue to be the workhorse of the Trans-Pacific North. And those are services that we at the Port of Portland and our colleagues in Tacoma and Seattle are looking at capturing. Not only the big ships, but some of those niche services that really uh, provide an opportunity for shippers to get superior service, quick transit, quick turn, and mind you, containers going in both directions because the PNW has ample export cargo for the backhaul to Asia on the international services. So all that taken together, we think with the opportunity for transloading, will make the PNW ports uh, very viable in the, in the next few years, but it's going to be a slow recovery. Well, Greg, that's an interesting look into uh, PNW ports. Thanks for sitting down and speaking with us today. Thank you very much, Russell. Greg Borisay, Port of Portland, speaking with us about Pacific Northwest Transloading. Thank you for watching.